this uh, sh was showing. And um, Daniel is, um, he received a bachelor's degree from DePaul in political science and a master's degree from Yale Divinity School. He's presently uh, a doctoral student at the Catholic University and the subject of his dissertation is the scientific um, studies of Medjugorje. And so we've asked, uh, we've asked Daniel to come here today to speak to us about that, something important for us to know about. So please welcome Daniel Klimek. Hi. Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. So I'm going to speak about um, the scientific studies, but also my testimony incorporated because Medjugorje has changed my life in drastic ways. I've, um, I've had a conversion experience and I've, I've never been the same since. And I just feel that I need to testify to all that Our Lady's done for me. So uh, I've I've come from a Catholic family, a Polish Catholic family, but uh, unfortunately for many years I didn't have a strong relationship with the Lord. I was far from Him. I, I didn't have a strong faith. Uh, you could say that I was a bit of a agnostic, culturally Catholic, but spiritually agnostic. So I, we attended Mass every, every Sunday, but, uh, but unfortunately I realized that I was physically present at Mass but spiritually absent. My body was there, but my soul was elsewhere. And, and growing up and g going to high school, um, I went through a dark phase. I experienced some problems. I, I, was, I, I fell in love, and I fell in love with someone in a very unhealthy relationship. And, and I remember that when I fell in love, I tr turned my back towards God because, because in this love, I felt an ecstasy that I didn't feel in prayer. So, so this was an unhealthy relationship for a couple of reasons. One was we used to drink together excessively. This led to addiction, a strong addiction, and I was in a very dark place. I remember there were days when I couldn't go three, four, five days, sometimes it seemed daily, without getting completely wasted on like It was just a deplorable state. And interestingly, sometimes when we, when we hit rock bottom, that's when, we, uh, that's when we feel closest to God because we experience the mortality of life in a deeper way. And I remember that I, when I hit rock bottom, I just, I cried out. I cried out for help. You know, it was a cry that came from a very deep, dark, and desperate part of the heart. And essentially, it was a prayer. And I started praying again. I started praying to the Lord. Somebody gave me a prayer card of St. Rita of Cassia patron saint of impossible causes. And I thought that my cause was impossible, so I prayed to her. I prayed for intercession. I also received a prayer card of Our Lady, prayed for her intercession. Slowly but surely, detachment from the addictions that were possessing me formed. And I was freed. And God was good to me. I went to college. I, I came from a couple of public high schools where most of the students never go to college. It was a great blessing. And in college, I was very successful. I, I studied political science. I received a prestigious internship in Washington, D.C., working for ABC's show This Week with George Stephanopoulos. I was exposed to a very politically elite media culture. I was exposed to such guests on the show like Joseph Biden, Condoleezza Rice, John Kerry, and many others. And afterwards, I, I earned another internship working for a U.S. Senator's office in Chicago, the office of Senator Dick Durbin. Um, at the time, Senator Obama was just one floor above us. And so, so I had a lot of success. And at age 21, I, I published a book. It was a book on the politics and economics of the abortion issue. It was a pro-life book. So there was a lot of worldly success. Yet still, there was something missing. There was something lacking. There was still a yearning in my soul for something deeper, which wasn't satisfied. So, so something happened in 2008. I received a book from someone. It was a strange book, a title I've never heard of before. It was called Medjugorje, The Message by Wayne Weibel. Yes. I had no idea what I was getting myself into reading that book. <laughs> no idea. 
<laughs> you pick up a book on Medjugorje and it's not a casual read. It's going to change your life. It's unbelievable. So as I read that book, the act of reading slowly became a spiritual experience. I remember feeling the warmth of God overcoming me. I remember feeling the, the beauty, the intensity of God's presence in my heart so deeply. And I fell in love. I fell in love with Our Lady, with her purity, with her beauty, with her messages, prayer, fasting, reconciliation with God. This was beautiful. This was unbelievable. And my heart screamed, yes! And, and I had a conversion experience. And, and it, was, it was fascinating because, you know, I was, I was gripped. I was gripped by the message of Medjugorje. I was gripped by Our Lady's presence. I was gripped by the visionaries, the example of these young people who, who after experiencing their apparitions, they started to attend a daily mass and then they stayed after Mass one hour, two hours, three hours in personal prayer. I've never seen such devotion amongst young people. It was, it, it was surreal for me. So, so I was just, uh, I, I wanted to emulate them. I mean, I mean, the joy that they carried themselves with, the humility, it was wonderful. And interestingly, while I'm having this conversion experience, while my heart's just opening up to this deeper, beautiful, sublime, supernatural reality, my mind is being a little stubborn. My, my intellect wants to see something empirical, something rational. So, so I'm asking myself, my intellect's asking, can this be real? Really? Marian apparitions in the 20th century, in the 21st century, visions of the wonder of God, can this be real? And then I found out, reading more books, academic books, journalistic books, that Medjugorje has been subjected to a lot of medical science. Randall Sullivan, in his book, The Miracle Detective, he writes, the apparitions in Medjugorje have been subjected to more medical and scientific examination than any other purported supernatural phenomenon in the history of the human race. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that something? So, so uh, yeah, praise God. So, so um, it, it, it's funny. Um, it, since um, in this part of my conversion experience, I'm looking at the science. Why don't I speak about the uh, scientific studies and the visionaries and what they show? My, uh, my dear friend, Christina Jorgota, she was, uh, she was saying to me these last few weeks that when she comes up to speak, she'll, she'll show that clip of me talking about the scientific studies to completely undermine my talk so I won't have any fresh material. <laughs> Thank God she was just kidding. So, yeah, the visionaries have been examined by so many teams, teams from France, teams from Italy, teams from Austria, from the United States, from Canada, from the UK. Um, they've been subjected to such sophisticated technology, electroencephalograms, electrocardiographs, uh, polygraph tests. Uh, they, they've even been under hypnosis. The EEG brain scan tests, they show that the visionaries are not suffering from any epileptic state when they're experiencing their aberrations. They're not suffering, they're not dreaming. They're in a state that is hyper awake. So it's not a form of lucid dreaming. It's not a sleep or dream state or any form of hallucination that can come from a sleep or dream state. Um, the polygraph tests show that the kids are not lying, the visionaries were not lying. The, I call them kids, but they're older than me. <laughs> they were kids in the 80s. Um, also, what do we got? Oh yeah, they've been tested for so much, uh, every form of hallucination. They're not experiencing pathological hallucination. They're not experiencing visual hallucination. They're not experiencing audio, uh, auditory hallucination. They're not experiencing any form of hallucination. Um, they've been tested for the possibility of, of a cataleptic state. In catalepsy, the muscles are suspended to the point of immobility. But during the apparitions, their muscles keep moving, uh, their facial muscles, in a normal way. So it's not a cataleptic state either. Uh, some doctors hypnotize the visionaries, trying to see whether the state that they enter could be self-induced, trying to induce the, the ecstasy under hypnosis. And the, the, what was induced under hypnosis was a radically different, weaker ecstasy than the ones that the visionary enter in apparition. So radically different and it proved that it cannot be self-induced. Psychological studies were uh, performed on the visionaries, testing them for neuroses or hysteria. 
One of the leading doctors, a French physician named Dr. Henri Jouet, uh, led a team in the 80s and the 90s, investigating the visionaries over and over. His uh, conclusion in one report stated, the visionaries have no symptoms of anxiety or obsession or neurosis, no phobic or hysterical neurosis, no hypochondriac or psychosomatic neurosis, and there is no indication of any psychosis. We can make these formal statements in light of the detailed clinical examinations. Doctors report would go on to say the ecstasies are not pathological, nor is there any element of deceit. No scientific discipline seems able to describe these phenomena. He explained, quote, these visionaries are healthy and there is no sign of epilepsy, nor is it a sleep or dream state. It is neither a case of pathological hallucination nor hallucination in the hearing or sight faculties. It cannot be a cataleptic state for during ecstasy the facial muscles are operating in a normal way. Another doctor, Dr. Ludwig Stopar, who was a Yugoslavian psychiatrist and MD, he stated after examining the visionaries, scientific and sociological tests, including neuropsychiatric, medical, psychological, somatic, adolescent and young adult profiles, lifestyle characteristics, and intelligence and educational standards show the children to be absolutely normal and free from all psychopathological reactions. Then Dr. Stopar said something that was very strange for a man of a science to say, uh, very unique. He stepped outside his uh, boundary, his profession, and he said, I had the impression of coming into contact with a supernatural reality in Medjugorje. Isn't that beautiful? There was, uh, there was an Italian physician named Dr. Michael Sabatini. Here comes a big word. He's a psychopharmacologist. Don't ask me what that means. But, but he, he came and he used this instrument called an algometer. An algometer, it's an instrument that tests uh, pain, measures pain by applying pressure to sensitive areas of the body. Now his test showed that before experiencing their apparitions, the visionaries react to pain in a normal way. However, during their apparitions, they're completely impervious to pain. There, there's no, they don't experience any pain. So, so these tests combined with the EEG brain scan tests that, that showed that the visionaries are hyper awake presented a contradiction, according to another doctor, Luigi Frigerio, a contradiction that, quote, cannot be explained naturally and thus can only be preternatural or supernatural. The point is when you're hyper awake, which the visionaries are, you're supposed to be able to feel pain. The fact that they're not feeling pain shows that they enter into a profound ecstatic state that scientists do not fully understand. Dr. Marco Marginelli, Italian neurophysiologist, he was an atheist. He came to Medjugorje to disprove these apparitions as a fraud. He admitted it. I want to prove this to be false. He had a history of going around fr from location to location where there was reports of mystical phenomena trying to debunk them. He tried to debunk the uh, stigma of Padre Pio going to San Giovanni Rotondo. In 1988, he came to Medjugorje. He would end up saying, quote, we were certainly in the presence of an extraordinary phenomenon. He tested the visionaries. He tested their ecstasies. He saw that the ecstasies were authentic. They're not self-induced. Doctor, doctor then uh, experienced a couple things which really disturbed him, frightened him. He encountered a woman who was miraculously healed of leukemia. But what, what really bothered him was the behavior of the birds before and after the apparitions. The birds would gather in the trees by the hundreds uh, before the apparitions would begin, and they would be so loud, chirping and cooing. The second that the apparitions would begin, the second that the visionaries fell on their knees, every bird would go completely silent. And that absolute silence of the birds that haunted him. Doctor, re doctor returned to Italy, and he admitted that that silence of the birds had haunted him for weeks. And eventually, Dr. Marginelli became a practicing Catholic. <laughs> um. 
So, so this is phenomenal. And, and experiencing, experiencing all these uh, scientific conclusions, reading about them, this, uh, this completed my conversion. I realized that this phenomenon of the apparitions of Our Lady of Medjugorje is fascinating on every level, not just the spiritual, but the scientific. My intellect, my, intellect, my mind, was as converted as my heart. And, and the Lord was good to me. The Lord was so good to me. Um, after college, I applied to, uh, to divinity school to study religion. To my great surprise and joy, I, I got accepted into Yale. And I remember when that letter came, it was a letter of acceptance where they proudly uh, boasted that the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, would be joining the faculty the year that I was to arrive. And I was just thinking to myself, God has been so overwhelmingly good to me. You know, just a few years before, I was in a wretched state. I was an addict. I had problems, uh, serious, serious issues. I had, I had no future. I thought I would never go to school. Now I would be attending one of the best universities in the world. So God was so good to me. He was overwhelmingly good to me. And Our Lady says, live my messages and you will see miracles. Do not, and I cannot help you. I was seeing miracles, but I wanted to see more miracles in my life. One of the miracles that I wanted to see was in my family, with my parents. My parents, unfortunately, are two people who have a horrible marriage, my beloved parents. Um, yeah, two people who hate each other. There's no polite way of putting it. So, yeah, so, so um, a few years back, they had, um, they had a fight, and it was on Christmas Eve. And they stopped talking to each other for days. And then days turned into weeks. And then weeks turned into months. And then months turned into a year. And then a year turned into numerous years. So when I converted after Our Lady's uh, intercession, I started living the messages. I wanted to pray for them. I wanted to fast for them. I wanted to see reconciliation. This is ridiculous. So I offered a rosary for them every day, and I did the bread and water fast for them. A couple of months later, I received a phone call from my brother. He, he said, uh, I, I was on the East Coast. He was in Chicago. He said, uh, uh, something strange is happening. I, I said, what do you mean? Well, they're actually talking to each other. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> This past Christmas, uh, Christmas break, the Lord asked me to fast for another relationship, to reconcile another relationship. It, it's phenomenal, the power of fasting. My, my mother hasn't spoken to her sister in years. Uh, you should understand we're, we're Polish. We come from a very polite culture. When we get angry with each other, we don't yell at each other. It's uh, passive aggressive behavior. It's uh, <laughs> silent treatment is very prominent with us. So she hasn't spoken to her sister for years. And my aunt, she, uh, she got a visa for, uh, to come to the States from Poland, and she came in the fall uh, to stay with her son, and she really wanted to see uh, my mom, her sister. And my mom refused to see her. And then one day when I'm back for Christmas break, there's somebody at the door, and it's my aunt, who I haven't seen in years since I was a child. And I was shocked. And, and overjoyed, I, I kissed her on each cheek, I embraced her, I said, come on in, I was so overjoyed, I was thinking to myself, here we go, reconciliation time, Lord is good, Lord is good. So, so I, I, I walk her into my mother's room, I said, you have a guest here, a special guest, and then I leave them alone. A couple minutes later, my aunt comes out of that room, she walks into the kitchen and she says, I need to go home. I said, why, what happened? My sister refuses to speak to me. And when she said, I, my, my heart honestly broke, I was just distraught, I was destroyed. I had so many feelings, an admixture of feelings, anger, frustration, sadness. I walked into my mother's room and I said, what are you doing? Do you know how difficult it is for her to be here? Do you know how hard this is for her? And she just said very coldly, I have nothing to say to her. And I was very angry with my mother, but the Lord allowed me to recognize in prayer that my, that my beloved mother is a person who 
who had a lot of wounds in her life and she wants to forgive, but it's so difficult for her because of those wounds. So, so that night, I, I went into my room and I was just destroyed and I wanted to find some refuge. I wanted to pray and I wanted, and there were, there were a couple things in my room, sources of refuge. On the desk, there was, uh, there was Bible, there were prayer books, there were spiritual things, and there was also alcohol. <laughs> and it was a heavy night, so I was thinking to myself, I need both tonight. <laughs> and I, I did. I, I had a big uh, glass of wine, very strong wine that my father makes. I put it on the desk, and I start praying. I'm just uh, giving the Lord my heart. I'm saying to him, Lord, forgive her. Please forgive her. And I said to the Lord, there's so much unforgiveness in my family. There's so much unnecessary pride. Please, Lord, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Forgive them. And that prayer of Jesus on the cross, it just kept coming back to me. Lord, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Please forgive them. Please forgive them. And at one point, I realized how powerful fasting has been in my life. So I asked the Lord, what can I give up, Lord? What can I renounce? What can I fast from to reconcile this relationship, to make some reparation? What can I give up? Let me know. <laughs> and at that moment, I took a tiny uh, sip of the wine. And as I took a tiny sip, something fascinating happened. My right arm started trembling uncontrollably. That's, that's never happened before. And I realized, that, okay, Lord's giving me a sign here. He's being very physical. And, and I, I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, you want me to give up alcohol, don't you? And as I said this, the Holy Spirit overcame me, and my eyes started flickering like crazy, and I'm having this experience of God, a very powerful experience. And in this experience, the Lord allowed me to understand, and yes, He wants me to give up alcohol for the rest of my life to make reparation for sins of the family. And I said to the Lord, Okay, your will, your will, Lord, not mine, your will. A couple months later, the grace of conversion entered my mom's heart. Her heart was melted. She did something that took a lot of humility and a lot of courage. She picked up the phone. She called her sister. She said, this is ridiculous. We're adults. We're sisters. Come over. Come have dinner with me. Come spend the day with me. Her sister was so overjoyed, she broke down crying. And reconciliation transpired. Praise God. Amen. Amen. After Yale, I applied for PhD programs. I honestly was not expecting expecting to get in because it's so competitive. I mean, these PhD programs, they accept like a handful of persons from, from hundreds, from hundreds. Sometimes it's two or three that they accept. But Our Lady interceded again. She sent me a cardinal. She sent me the Archbishop of Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. So uh, Cardinal Schönbrunn, Christoph Schönbrunn, I love the man. He, uh, he made a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. Yes, yes, amen, Christoph Schönbrunn, amen. He made a pilgrimage to Medjugorje that year. I believe it was late 2009. Shortly thereafter, I heard that he was coming to the Catholic University of America to uh, give a talk. And I was up in uh, Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. But I said to myself, I got to get down there. This man's such a holy man, such an influential presence in the church. And he just came from Medjugorje. He spent time with the visionaries. I appreciate that so much. So I got to get down there and see him. So I thought to myself, I'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll, uh, I'll send the professor who's on the admissions committee, who's the director of the program that I'm applying for, uh, email. I'll be in DC. Let's do an interview. And I did. The interview was scheduled in the morning, and Cardinal Schonburn was speaking in the evening. So I, I get on a Greyhound bus excruciating overnight rides, transferring uh, buses at 3 a.m. It's horrible. And <laughs> all-nighter, all-nighter on the bus. And I, 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 get in, uh, I get in D.C. very sleep-deprived and tired. And um, I meet the professor. We had a nice conversation. Um, we're talking about spirituality. It's the program of spirituality that I was applying to. And at one point in this meeting, the professor asked me, if you get into this program, what would you like to write your dissertation on? And I know that Medjugorje, Medjugorje is a pretty controversial subject with some people, <laughs> but that's what I wanted to write on. So I wasn't sure what to say. There was an awkward silence for about 14 seconds. 
ridiculous. And, and he was staring at me. And uh, eventually I thought to myself, look, I made a trip overnight on a Greyhound bus. You just got to let it out. So I'm like, professor, these visionaries in Medjugorje have been examined by all these scientific studies. It's unbelievable. The doctors can disprove this stuff. I, I just let it all out. And I, 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 I'm, I'm observing his face very carefully. And I see this smile slowly forming. And I see that he likes it. And, <laughs> yes. and he shakes my hand, and it was a wonderful meeting, and I was on cloud nine. It was awesome. It was awesome. And, and then I left for uh, Cardinal Schoenberg's appearance. Cardinal Schoenberg came out. <laughs> he came out. He was like a young cuddle boy, too. He had style. And he, he, um, he gave a very academic lecture on the secularization of Europe, and he was speaking for for the need of a spiritual renewal, the kind of spiritual renewal that we had in the mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans in the medieval period. We need to see something like that today. Q&A session came, and this young lady comes up to the microphone. And I, I, I didn't, know, it back, I didn't know, it, know this back then, but she was a journalist for Mary TV, so she comes up to the microphone. And as she comes up, um, very strangely, the microphone just dies. So. Uh, so she shouts out her question. Your eminence, you're speaking about renewal in Europe. What about Medjugorje? <laughs> An absolute silence permeates the room. You could hear a pin drop. It, it became a very awkward moment. But Carno Schoenberg, a very sharp, very funny man in his deep, thick Austrian accent, says to her, easier question you don't have. <laughs> and I guess she didn't. But I was very glad that she asked that. And his answer was something. At first, it was very politically correct. He was speaking about, ab about how the church is still investigating Medjugorje. We need to wait until the church makes its uh, final decision, and we'll go with whatever the decision is. But then the cardinal got personal. He shared his testimony. He was saying, how many young people in Austria have converted because of Medjugorje, because of these apparitions? How many seminarians have I received because of Medjugorje? He said, if I was an opponent of Medjugorje, I would have to close down my, my seminary in Austria. And, and as he was saying this, he was, he was, uh, uh, t uh, his voice was getting shaky. It was very emotional. It was a beautiful testimony. And I was just so grateful to be there and hear it. This uh, leader of the church, this eminent holy cardinal, speaking so beautifully about Our Lady's apparitions. Praise God. Amen. So as I'm back in Yale and waiting for a bunch of rejection letters, there was... There was one big envelope that showed up from the Catholic University of America, and it was, uh, it was an acceptance letter to the PhD program, and it, I would be studying spirituality, and I could write my dissertation on Medjugorje. And the, the man who interviewed me, that professor, was made my advisor. And I realized if Cardinal Schoenberg wouldn't have gone to Medjugorje that time, and I make the visit to CUA, I probably would have no interest in coming down for an interview, and I would not have perhaps even gotten into that program. So it was such a blessing from Our Lady, truly. I came to the Catholic University hoping to become an academic and a scholar, very arrogant, and <laughs> theologian, <laughs> my big words, and, and God had other plans, as usual. So, so I'm there for two years, and eventually, I get these strong consolations in prayer that the Lord may be calling me to a priestly vocation. I, uh, I, I go meet this wonderful Polish priest. He's a chaplain over there, uh, Father Marek. I said, he's like, Father says to me, Daniel, what's new? I said, Father, I'm getting these consolations in prayer. Maybe, maybe the Lord wants me to be a priest. He's like, Daniel, I think you should do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it, it, this sermon was such a roller coaster ride. It was up and down, up and down, up and down. One day I am on top. I'm thinking to myself, this is it. I'm going to be a knight for Our Lady fighting for the Queen of Heaven, slaying demons and dragons for her. This is unbelievable. And the next day I'm down here, I'm like, no, man, I can't do this. No, absolutely not. I'm too weak. This isn't for me. I got insecurities. God, you find somebody stronger. <laughs> no, it's not for me. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. 
and then came a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. <laughs> so I spent three weeks in Medjugorje that summer, and I was looking for confirmation, some kind of confirmation. Lord, do you want this vocation? I went to confession my second day there. There were two lines outside of St. James that day. There was an Italian line and an English line. Italian line was very long. There were like 16 people. English line, like three people. So I was thinking to myself, I'll get in quickly. And as I'm waiting, the Italians are, the line is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. We haven't even moved one person. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, eventually, the Italian priest is out. He's done. I, I'm getting irritated. Think to myself, what is this priest doing in there? He's probably got a serial killer in there. <laughs> and then a nice little old lady walks out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> same situation, next person in front of me, young man, goes in there. He's in there 45 minutes to an hour. His brother goes in there. He's in there 45 minutes to an hour. What is he preaching in there? But I notice that when these people come up, there's light on their face. Something's happening inside. So, I mean, of course, something's happening. They're being absolved of their sins, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But something else, too. Uh, so I walk in, and it was this special Irish priest, a very holy man. He did something uh, fascinating when I was there. He started reading my soul, and he told me some of the deepest secrets and struggles of my soul and he was getting it right. And I'm realizing that these people are in there so long because they're having this Padre Pio-like experience with this mystical priest. And I'm like, all right, all right, here you go. And at one point, this priest asked me in this confession, can I pray over you? May I pray over you? I said, yes, Father. Yes, he can. So uh, he, he puts his hand over my forehead. He starts praying over me. At one point, he asked, can I put my hand on your heart? Yes, yes, you can. He, he puts his hand on my heart. And as he has his hand on my heart, he kind of bends his, bends his uh, head and he starts mumbling to himself as he's praying. He said, thank you, Jesus. Then he looks up at me and he says, Jesus is calling you to be a priest. And when he said that all that fear and anxiety left me, if you want it, Lord, let it be done. I am weak, but you are my strength. Like Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, okay. well, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> so, so I come back for the school year and it's going so well. I find this order that I want to join, and it's this single-mindedness of purpose. I'm just going forward. I want to be a soldier of Christ, work for his kingdom. This is what I want. I feel such supernatural joy in me. It's going this way for months and months and months and months. And then this dear, beautiful, sweet, holy girl walks into my life. <laughs> and that happens often, I hear, when a guy's discerning. And she knew that I was discerning, so we had a very careful, discernful relationship. And we had so much attraction and affection for each other, truly. Such a dear girl. Then there was a time of separation when she was away for spring break. She went up to Connecticut, and a time of separation between two people who have so much affection for each other could be quite healthy. So, so when she was away, there was a Thursday. It was a Thursday that I had spiritual direction. And in that spiritual direction session, we came to the conclusion that I should try religious life. I basically have a friend. He's a married man with children. He once asked himself when he was discerning a vocation, whether, uh, whether he should be a priest, which path should he take? And the question that he asked was, would I regret not taking one path over the other? And he realized, if I never become a husband or a father, I would always regret that, he said to himself. So he had to take that path. Asking myself that question in spiritual direction, I realized, if I never become a husband or a father, I could live with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, kids are great, but you know, they could be annoying. <laughs> so, but, but, I, but I also, <laughs> we should hear some clapping for that one. <laughs> but, I, but I also realized, uh, you know, I realized if I never get a chance to absolve sins, to preach the gospel, to, to celebrate the mass, to, uh, you know, just, just, to, just to carry God's divine mercy to needy souls as a priest, I, was, I would always regret that. 
And that's when my spiritual director, such an enlightened man, said, All right, Daniel, we're done. You know which one? That's it. <laughs> Don't even say anymore. And that same day, my girlfriend, she, uh, she was at home, and she was having a very intense, serious prayer session with the Lord. She was struggling with the Lord. She was praying for hours and hours about this relationship. And her prayer session ended with the supernatural joy in her. And she realized that the Lord's asking her to step back from this relationship. And, and then we had the most lovely, beautiful, affectionate breakup. <laughs> Somebody asked me, you know, what, what's the best part of that relationship? Man, you should hear about our breakup. It was like two people who almost seemed in love breaking up with each other. And, and, and beautifully, goodwill too. Um, but she shared something with me. She shared something so beautiful. She's a very uh, holy girl with a deep charism, spiritual gifts. And when we were friends, before we were even dating, there was a moment where she was praying over me and she received a vision from, from the Lord. She didn't understand what this vision meant necessarily, why she received it, because it didn't make perfect sense when we were friends, but now it made perfect sense that we were dating. And when we were friends, before dating, she prayed over me, and the Lord showed her a vision of my soul, and he showed her an indelible mark of the priesthood, Christ's priesthood, and then he spoke to her, and he said to her three words, protect his vocation. God is good. Amen. So I'm, uh, I'm currently applying to join a Franciscan order, Father Michael Scanlon's boys, the TORs. Yes! Amen. TOR. <laughs> I think to myself, how unbelievably good the Lord has been to me. Just think about it, the Franciscan habit. I mean, this is the habit of Francis of Assisi. This is the habit of Bonaventure. This is the habit of Padre Pio. This is the habit of Maximilian Colby. This is the habit of Father Swafko and Father Yozo. It's unbelievable. What honor. So, so God has been so oh, unbelievably good to me. Just a blessing. Such a, a, a wonders with my life for, from a very dark beginning, very dark past. So I ask you, dear friends, to pray for me as I go forward in seminary this coming year. God willing, may, uh, may I have the strength to pursue this vocation. And... Uh, I thank you so much for listening. God bless you and our lady protect you. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. That was just a great testimony. He, he's a funny guy. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Father Daniel Klimek, that sounds good. <laughs> Hold on for just, we have one more uh, testimony, and uh, then we'll go for lunch break. Uh, back in the early years, man, I think it was the second year here at Notre Dame, we had a testimony by a man who had just gotten out of prison. And... Uh, it was a surprise uh, testimony. I, I, we weren't, didn't really know what to expect, but um, Jim came up here and he gave his testimony. And his testimony, I think we sold more video of his testimony than any, any that we've ever had here at Notre Dame. And then from then he went around the country giving his testimony about how God had touched him in the prison at, uh, in New Jersey. So we're going to show just a short clip of this, of this talk that he gave at Notre Dame in, I believe it was 1991. And then his wife, Catherine, is going to come up and just give a little short. She wrote a book about this, um, about this, and so she'll tell you a little bit more about that, but it's just a shorter testimony. So let's first of all look at this clip, and then, then Catherine will come up and speak to you about it. Praise be Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm all yours, and all that I have is yours, our most loving Jesus. Through Mary, your Holy Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou, O women, 
And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Bless me, Holy Virgin Mary. You are your divine Son, Jesus.